Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Real Retail Podcast, where we explore retail development and retail experiences. Today, we dive into the world of augmented reality and its transformative impact on the retail landscape. My guest, James Purchase, have been at the storefront of developing services aimed at empowering retailers to thrive into today's competitive market. Join us as we discuss how AR is reshaping the retail experience, the challenges and opportunities it presents, and how retailers can harness this technology to stay ahead of the curve and meet the evolving expectations of consumers. James, hello. Hope you're doing well, and I'm so happy to see you again after a brief encounter last year in London. And since then, I knew that you were working on a beautiful project. You have been working on developing a service that can add value to retailers and that can help them gain a competitive edge in today's retail environment. So can you tell us about yourself and a few words about your project? Sure, yeah. Well, thanks for having me Galia. Um, this is a really good uh, second meeting and we met at the visual marketing show I think last the year. Display, yeah. The M display show And uh, that was part of my journey into retail as well because I'm, I'm, an, I'm an architect by training and I moved into the world of AR and mixed reality and technology about two and a half years ago. Um, I saw the the power that it was going to have in the future going forward by essentially overlaying um, digital content on the real world was the thing that got me very excited. Having worked in the real world architecture for um, many years, um, this seemed like the next frontier to get involved with. And one of those uh, concepts which we have now developed is something called PopXR. So this looks, it, the idea came around originally um, kind of from my architectural background. Uh, we're looking, I was thinking about ways of uh, activating spaces quickly on the high street. Um, we all know some of the challenges we've got on the high streets at the moment, um, but there's obviously positive signs happening now. But it's just this, the whole concept of being have, able to have a meanwhile experience in spaces that um, for some reason or other are not being used or activated on the high street or in a mail space, for example. And um, the concept of fusing uh, my experience with, uh, you know, detailing and designing physical objects with my knowledge of and the team's knowledge of creating digital content as well came together. <laughs> and we put an application into Innovate UK, which is a technology funding grant service in the UK and we developed PopXR which is essentially two things but they only work with one another together so there's a digital aspect and there's a physical aspect so um, the idea was to get something that could go up very quickly and activate a space or a store so that needed to be modular and look good so it's a a very uh, it's an architecturally designed structure made out of sustainable plywood that can go up in a couple of hours but then what we do is we have a, a digital twin of that structure which the structure can also be flexible it can shape itself to kind of any format really because it's modular and then we have templates that will then overlay digital content on that um, physical structure hmm. which we can showcase digital uh, like videos digital content 3d assets and then view those using a the latest uh, headsets um, which are pass through so that allows you to see your environment so this is not vr this is melding physical and digital um environments together so you can talk to each other at the same time which is really important i think for that social interaction when you're going through this kind of experience and the most important thing is it opens up a new level of story telling I think in terms of immersion for brands as well and also because we've got a template and it's a tangible kind of approach to breaking down the digital content it opens up that um, we keep the cost down mm -hmm. and it opens up this kind of pop-up digital experience to another level of brands so it, it makes it more focused on 
brands that already have a digital presence is ideal because they've got digital content and of course we know that um a lot of product modeling now happens in in their digital space as well so we can reuse all of those kind of things and get this up and running in a couple of hours with the work up front of course but the actual physical setup is a couple of hours and then we're we're ready to go so that's kind of me speeding through it a bit yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting concept and it's very agile. So we're talking about concepts today that give the opportunities, opportunity or opportunities to retailers um, to inject a certain uh, novelty or a kind of um, experience that they could not do in their traditional physical setups. And it also gives them that opportunity to uh, talk with consumers, uh, get in touch with them more easily and engage and in a, in a playful way, if, if I might say. So there is that edge of um, blending digital in, uh, physical and digital, yes. making those digital stores uh, more lively um, and more immersive. But is it an easy thing to do today um, for retailers, like rethinking the dynamic of their retail experiences and going out from that traditional mindset that was pretty much formatted? Today, you're giving the opportunity for retailers to rethink uh, the way they could communicate with consumers by giving that canvas or that template for them to come and inject different kinds of information, either product related or com related, uh, to add that value to, uh, to their physical experience. But do they understand how this works or are you still in the process of evangelizing, if I might use the term, uh, the concept? Yeah, I think it's we just um, I think maybe like 12 months ago, it was uh, certainly a harder thing to talk about. I think a lot of uh, a lot of people now are becoming um, uh, that, that, that knowledge level is rising. So I am still evangelizing, but products like um, it's already, you know, the big tech businesses. So, for example, Apple Vision Pro have launched their um, AR or mixed reality headset. So that's been a real sort of profile boost for what the technology can do. Mm. Um, that's obviously, see, that was marketed originally as an at-home device, but we've seen people, you know, outdoors using the using the technology. Similarly, with the MetaQuest headset that we use, that again is has raised the profile and has made it a lot more affordable to get into so i think i think yeah there's work to be done and um as always with these things seeing is believing so getting people um to come along and try the technology is is the is the key thing i think and um most of the time you know pretty much everybody is just um pretty blown away by it so I think there's a there's a bit of way to go but it still makes it a very unique experience as well which is quite interesting and for that to happen on the high street um, I'm not aware of that happening anywhere at the moment so that's the, that experiential the moving away from the um from the sort of uh product-based in-store selling of an item moving to more of a um which can happen here but moving to more of a storytelling narrative, engagement, being able to get a customer into a space uh, in the pop-up, in, in a physical location that um, you have their attention for, say, like maybe t five, ten minutes as well is quite, you know, that's a one-on-one -on -one interaction you're having, which, you know, is, um, I think that's quite, that's quite um, valuable. Um, yeah. Yeah. And if I might, do you, do you have at the moment uh, brands or specific types of brands that are interested in that service? And by specific, I might be uh, tending to ask if there is uh, an appetence for that product uh, to be used more by luxury brands or more mass brands uh, speaking to consumers in a different way. Are you starting to see a certain tendency towards the adoption of that service uh, from retailers that you're contacting? I've certainly, um, in terms of smaller startups, I've had very a lot of interest. Um, we're, we're speaking to a, uh, a shoewear brand um, called Dubs Universe, who really want to do something. Um, so we're just trying to work out ways in which we can 
work together on that. Um, I think objects, things like we've had interest from our demonstrator is based on uh, trainers, so it, it's very well suited to that kind of object um, interaction and that kind of storytelling, and also very sort of detailed technical um, products as well, where we can show detail and exploded views and things like that. Uh, so we've had interest on the on the, the footwear front. We've also had interest from a beauty product line. Um, which is a very is a more of a challenging thing to think about in three dimensions, but we're looking into how we might do that. That's called um, sense of place here in the UK. Mm. And then also, I think independent artist as well. We have a toy artist who's been interested, who works in a native three dimensional um, modeling techniques so we can bring his artwork into into the high streets. So that was when it turns into more of a gallery type space, which is quite interesting. And um, so it, it's very flexible. But I think in terms of we've agencies have contacted us looking for unique experiences for brands. Um, but we're at the part where we've got a, a functioning uh, product now and now we're looking to have conversations with people for sure. So mm -hmm. raising that awareness is is going to be vital for sure. OK. And how do you see augmented reality transforming today the retail experience, particularly in terms of blending that digital and digital uh, uh, element within the store design? Yeah, so I think that's a really interesting question. I mean, something like PopXR can exist in a larger store setup, which is quite interesting. But I think as it's all going to be related to hardware and technology. So I think um, PopXR works off a headset. So you're kind of um, given a, a, a unique experience in that situation. And I think one of the things we'd like to explore is um, whether we can tailor uh, that kind of experience to the customer. Um, and of course, that kind of keys into larger brands with loyalty schemes and things like that. It means a certain amount of data is needed. But I quite like the idea of, say, say, for example, um, you had a shoe wear brand who had a, a customer base and one of part of their um, part of their uh, unique offers would be to invite it into a store to see the launch or have a personal experience of a launch of a trainer, for example. And it might be you know, maybe bespoke for them using their name and some details and things like that, what their preferences are. I think that could be really exciting in terms of engagement. I also think um, in terms of handheld devices and um, the technology for phones is is advancing all the time. And uh, I think we're, we're used to the kind of QR code approach to things. But um, what we're going to see, I think the technology is now in place for us to do very big uh, augmented reality sort of set piece experiences which is another interesting way of marketing stuff so I think those kind of things happening in store at a larger scale for customers um, is going to be something that needs to be considered and how those digital assets then interact with uh, the fit out of the shop so I think allowing for zones where these things can happen and um, you know, make it an accommodating the digital set piece within the physical design is going to be something we're going to see more of. So a bit like PopXR, where we've divided it up into kind of alcoves where we can place content, but obviously there's no content in there, um, is one of the things to, to consider for sure. Mm -hmm. And of course, with many uh, opportunities rising, there are challenges uh, that retailers face when implementing those technologies uh, into their physical stores. So how can we overcome these challenges? Do we need specific setups? We've naturally spoken about that uh, setup, but are there other um, tools that retailers should also think about to make the integration of such technology uh, easier uh, or more flexible, if you want to use that term? Uh, yeah, I think um, obviously being very mindful of what your um, three-dimensional digital asset strategy is, is going to be really important. So having that um, having that library or store of your products 
as a three-dimensional model will mm -hmm. make things a lot easier going forward so i think you know scanning technology is making really great progress at the moment as well there's lots of different things happening on that front it's moving at quite a pace it's quite difficult to keep up with but i think you know we're going to be moving from say you know a photographic um nice photographs of a product to an actually a fully three-dimensional record of your product which can then be used in many different ways you could deploy it in store in ar you can use it online as an explorable object and you can also use it as a still image once you render it out so i think there's this uh, viewing viewing your your um product range um as a digital range as well is, is something that needs to be that's definitely the the the, the way forward i think Right. And in your opinion, in what ways does AR impact the overall customer journey from discovery to purchase? And how can retailers leverage this technology to optimize each stage? Oh, well, yeah, big, big question. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, so. I think in terms of the customer journey, um, we, you know, looking at this in terms of from a pop XR point of view, which um, it's building that um, that end to end journey. So from dis discoverability is really important. So I think um, the call to action is something you know with digital content, you know, something that actually isn't there, but um, is. <laughs> it's trying to leverage again those three dimensional assets really early on with social media calls to action and um, building interests and building excitement over you know how you're going to place this digital content possibly gamification is also in, can be integrated into that which i forgot to mention before that's going to be that's going to be part of the process interacting with these digital items and you know collecting you know loyalty points things like that which doesn't necessarily happen to need to happen in store. That can happen in a location, in different ge ge geographic locations potentially. Um, but yeah, so uh, using social media, leveraging social media, of course, in the first instance, and raising awareness, getting people to the the, the location, because we see this very much as like a location-based social event. Um, and once they're in store or they're doing using the experience, I think capturing um, capturing elements of that in terms of video content, uh, 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 bespoke aspects of the three dimensional experience that they're going through can then be used as a after service to for people when they've got home, for example. So I think keying that into, you know, after store experience is going to be very important. So there may be, for example, uh, an at home augmented reality experience that can be linked to this, um, like a limited time experience at home that they can access, or they may be able to sign up for a digital experience that they can share at home, for example, and then reshare on um, socials as well mm -hmm. so i don't necessarily think it, it this 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 journey might not necessarily be about um sales on the spot it might be more of a um a sort of like a continuous yeah something that builds and maybe creates traction with other people as well something you know people go home and say oh look at this you know, i've got this video of us doing this experience with these brands and that will start to generate um other possibilities and NFTs could be part of that journey, of course, as well. And, you know, the fact that people have to sort of, you know, we, you know, data tracking is, is controversial, of course, but of course, when somebody uses the experience, we can always look to try and get some kind of um, feed customer feedback from those uh, kind of things as well, by tracking, you know, for example, you know, there's a potential when you're using in a, a headset experience to kind of track the eye movements as well and see where certain interest lies and things like that to try and, you know, improve things. So that's quite interesting as well. Mm -hmm. Really nice uh, to hear about that because um, it extends beyond the physical realm and it either starts before coming to the store and uh, goes further after and as you said it might recreate uh, or repurpose the concept into something else uh, and it's a it's a nice um, journey and we we talked earlier that uh, most 
mostly uh, entrepreneurs were interested in this kind of service. But when we're talking about brands that exist uh, or existed for a long time and have been existing um, in physical spaces, uh, how important do you think is it for these types of retailers to strike a balance between AR experiences and maintaining the authenticity and the essence of their brand in that physical experience because you know it better than I do that sometimes when we test and go into new uh, retail concepts, we might diverge from our own. So mm. how do you think we can balance those? Yeah, I think um, that's a really good point. And I think the thing that was always excited me about AR technology and um, also this is it's that you it, the approach needs to be taken of enhancing what you've you know in those situations you can you can start from nothing and create a whole experience which we've kind of covered from that but then there's also this enhancement of an existing environment I think is really important that's that's where the um there could be a lot of a lot of um a very powerful approach there by working with existing brand stories and revealing in a more sensitive way um narratives behind products and things like that mm -hmm. say for example in store locations that have a lot of history for example you know those kind of things could be explored um we do a lot we do work in heritage as well so that's all about hidden history sort of hidden narratives and um particularly associated with like a physical place so i think those kind of things could be really really interesting and exciting for brands with a lot of a lot of history behind them right and uh, we earlier mentioned a little bit uh, about the importance of data. What role does data analytics play in understanding consumer behavior within uh, these AR enhanced environments? And how can retailers use or utilize this data to improve their strategies? Yeah, I think it's well, uh, I think there's 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 many possibilities, obviously there's uh, these all these things need to be signed up to I mean the ability to track interactions with um, AR experiences through the phone um, you can get certain you can get location data you can not that we want to track anybody but in store for example you may be able to just locally um, see how the phone has been held you could also um, I think it's generally about sort of dwell time and interaction times with mm, different products mm. is the thing that, that you would be getting from that. If you've got some kind of gamification, of course, you can work, um, say, into a phone or a headset experience, you could work in kind of uh, questionnaires into that, for example, whilst worked into a gaming experience. So you could get yeah. little snippets of information preferences as well as they go through that gaming journey which could be really um useful and um i think again for the headsets we talked about the prospect of really i mean you know even just for um, launching a product or testing a product for example which is another sort of pre-store experience maybe for um for for brands is you know eye tracking dwell time levels of interest, those kind of things and interaction points um, could be really valuable, I think, for sure. Mm. So without actually having to roll out a physical test store, for example, those kind of things. Interesting. And as, as much as we move and we talk about this topic, we see that it's as important to have uh, an in-store technology uh, that is complemented uh, or completed with the smartphone, the, the consumer's mm. smartphone, and how these two um, tools, if we want to use the term tools, complete each other and are as important as um, brands can think of any experience because they have to consolidate uh, data uh, through them. Um, well, it's the next step. Sorry, it's an extension of ourselves now, isn't it? It's, exactly. It's a really exactly. powerful device that we take everywhere with us. So exactly. it's, it's, it has to be has to be part of the discussion, definitely. 
Interesting. Um, we used to talk about pop-up stores or pop-up events as a right here, right now event. And now we're talking about an extension of that right here, right now. And mm -hmm. it's even more interesting because we're creating a certain effect that goes beyond uh, the moment and that develops into something beautiful later on. James, if I may, and if it's not very confidential, uh, in terms of costs of these types of installations, can you give us some kind of idea uh, about uh, space, uh, square meter or footage of installation yeah. and approximative costs of these types of technologies? Yeah, I think um, the smallest that the PropXR experience goes down to in a usable way, because obviously the smaller, the less people you can have in it uh, is about 12 meters squared and that's a rough sort of um horseshoe shape um, but then it can expand to kind of any size really i think over mm -hmm. like say 30 meters squared you might look to want to break the space down um into different more different experiences which is something else we've, we've talked about for inhabiting like large scale spaces with this as a pop-up approach yeah. you might have several of them set up um so that that's that's in terms of the flexibility very flexible it can it can it doesn't always have to be in a horseshoe it could be like a, a wavy line we've got corner pieces that enable us to do different shapes essentially mm. um or even in the round you know even in a sort of like a circular format could work um i think in terms of cost brackets we're always looking at about i think for an installation of a sort of medium size, say like the 20 meters squared or something like that, I would say you're kind of starting at about um, 15,000 to get the actual structure in place um, for a, a landlord, for example, or or a, a unique experience for a brand um, because it's, um, uh, you know, we've already got it constructed, so we, we can just get there and put it in fairly quickly. And that would be for, say, a three month period, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of content um, modeling, we it's very flexible. I think probably starting off, say there's um, some assets available, some video content available. Um, we can put, um, say, <clears throat> screen records of Instagram stories in for video content at a very low, you know, as a really starter level, you're probably looking at about £1,500 and that would get you video content surrounding um, a product or a few products centrally located, which could be then be integrated with very simply. So that's a very low entry point. Mm -hmm. um, then you're scaling up probably incrementally in terms of what you want to do. And then it, it is kind of as long as a piece of string, but you know, you could probably put in a very acceptable, a very um, impressive, sorry, not acceptable, <laughs> um, piece of uh, interactive um, store content for £10,000 on top of that. Mm. It all depends on what we're working with from the starting point. And of course, uh, brands may have their own teams that they want to work with and we can do that and integrate their content into into the, the the framework essentially so okay interesting and how about the timeline let's say we contacted you at the beginning of the month how much time uh, do you need to implement or physically integrate uh, yourselves into a space i think it's uh probably a, a bare a minimum of two months depending where we're starting from with the digital content, of course. Um, ideally, it would be three months, but I think we could always we can always speed these things up because we are working with this. If we stick to the kind of um, template approach, then that can be really quick with video content, 3D content. As you diverge from the template, of course, we can do many other things, but that will just start to extend the timeline slightly. But yeah, that that's a kind of basic approach uh, average right? yeah okay perfect and james before we conclude um and if we look ahead what trends do you foresee in ar and digital design and how can retailers stay ahead of the curve in adopting these technologies to meet evolving customer expectations 
Now that's the big question. Yes. <laughs> that is the big question. I think, um, I think well, I, I mentioned before about having this approach to digital create curation within your brand and um, uh, products. I think that's that's going to help you stay ahead of it because you're then you're then ready to um, to make use of these technologies. So you know we've had discussions, and also I think maybe um, just to sort of educate yourself on it, it can be a bit painful because like I think the approach to presenting things in web on the web on a website in three D produce there's different types of file, mm. you know. So I've had brands where they're like. Oh, we've got this modeled in 3D already. And then when you speak to um, the people that have done it, it's like, yeah, it's specifically designed. We haven't got a 3D model, you know, so it looks like a 3D model, but it isn't a 3D model, if you see what I mean, because it's it's designed for web exploration. So there's, it's really very much coming from a gaming point of view. So you need to have a, a physical 3D asset and that can be scanned or it can be modeled, but those are the things just to, be aware of you know so if you if you think you've got 3d content on the website it might not actually be usable in these kind of uh, gaming environments which is what we use we use gaming software to deliver these experiences so mm. that's another that's another aspect that to be aware of as a brand um and uh what was it? the future yes i think it's just going to get um it's very much linked to uh hardware and software and uh, those two things. So I think the hardware, I think we'll, we've got the phone. So that's that's going to be around. That's going to be still there for at least another 10 years, I would say, and still keep advancing. advancing. But I think what we're going to start seeing more of is um, augmented reality glasses that are linked to your phone for processing power. I think we'll see the headset approach um, becoming more and more uh, reducing in size. So. It's kind of like both of these things, like the headsets, like kind of really powerful and probably a bit heavy. Then you've got the phone, which is super transportable. And then we've just got to get to a point in the middle where there's wearable AR glasses that can deliver um, AR experiences kind of almost at will. But then you've got the other thing, <laughs> which is going to be about connectivity. And I think that's the other challenge um, mm -hmm. for on the go AR is making sure we can stream content from cloud servers and all this kind of stuff um is going to be really important going forward so it's kind of a three-pronged development approach yeah. and i yeah. think we'll be seeing consumers wearing these glasses and we've got to think about the generation that is coming through as well they're very much digital native you know snapchat have already you know AR filters are used millions of times, if not even billions, every day. So we've very much got an augmented uh, reality native generation coming through, like my daughters, um, and it's becoming an expectation. So I think that needs to be keyed into um, mm. very early. And the experience will just, experiences will, the technology is moving so fast, they'll just get grander and more interactive. I think that's the thing to, to be aware of. I mean, Gorillaz, the band, did a played an album, did an augmented reality album launch in Times Square's and Piccadilly Circus uh, last year, which was using AR technology, which was very impressive. So, you know, these kind of things are possible now. It just needs to get the traction. Right. Interesting. Mm. Thank you for that. I mean, there is a future there. It's scary for some uh, or maybe dreamy for others, but I think we're moving into that direction. Now, James, before concluding, would you like to share any information regarding uh, how to get in touch with you if we want to work on a project uh, with PopXR and uh, if you have a website to share with us as well? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So um, it's Currently, it's Urban XR is the business, but we are going through a rebrand soon, but that'll be all over um, socials. But for the time being, it's it's urban-xr.com. My email address is James Lee at urban-xr.com. So yeah, just drop me a line and always happy to jump on a call and talk about stuff.
Perfect. Thank you so much for this enriching uh, uh, chit chat, uh, James, and all the best for the future. Have a nice day and hope to, to catch up soon on um, other occasions. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you Guardian. so much. Really, really great. Thank you. Thank you, James.